Please turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 16 and we'll roll on into chapter 4. Exodus 3, 16 is where we're going to start. It's Old Testament, second book of the Bible. I'll give you a second. If you found it, I would ask you to bow your head and your heart. And Father, we just thank you once again for allowing us to come together. Lord, we thank you for your grace. <clears throat> that you showed uh, so greatly 2,000 years ago. Lord, we thank you that we're able to worship um, in this country without uh, too much worry of, of anything happening, any real persecution, certainly not like our brothers and sisters overseas that are really going through persecution. But Father, we ask you to be with us here today, Lord. Anoint us with your spirit, our, our hearts, our minds, our ears, our tongues, everything, Father, as we go through your word. And we ask you to bless us with it today, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The uh, final draft of, I'm sorry, this is just, Jacob's got to worry about it now. The final draft of the Emancipation Proclamation was taken, was taken to Abraham Lincoln uh, at noon on January the 1st, 1863. And twice the president went to sign it, and twice he laid it down. He turned to his Secretary of State, William Seward, and he said, I've been shaking hands since 9 o'clock this morning, and my right arm is almost paralyzed. And if my name ever goes into history, it'll be for this act, and my whole soul is in it. But if my hand trembles when I sign the proclamation, all who examine the document hereafter will say he hesitated. The president then took up the pen and slowly but firmly wrote, Abraham Lincoln. He didn't want anyone to think that his heart wasn't in it. And that historic act, of course, endeared Lincoln to the world as the great emancipator. In my opinion, he's one of the greatest presidents of all time. But he was still hesitant. If you read his bio or anything about him, he was still hesitant about signing something that would so greatly change the fabric uh, of America even though he knew it had to be changed. He knew it was the right thing to do. If anyone ever rocked a boat, it was Abraham Lincoln. And you've got to remember, this is in the throes of war, civil war. He was a little hesitant. There's enough fire going on as it was, and he's about to pour, pour more on it. Hesitancy, that's what he was, he was a little hesitant is defined by some as reluctance, and then in turn, reluctance is defined as hesitancy. And the truth is that they both speak of someone waiting for various reasons to do something they feel they really ought to do, but they're still a little hesitant, namely for fear of the possible outcome, because there's going to be some backlash. No matter what he does, he knows it's the right thing to do, but he's still going to get a lot of backlash from it. And that's where we're going to find Moses today, and that is hesitant. Reluctant. We looked at him two weeks ago as a man who was going through an identity crisis, and we'll find him in that state yet again. Today we're going to see a man that has been lulled into a sense of mediocrity and tedium. He's been in the desert for 40 years. For 40 years, God had used that tedium of being a shepherd, the mundane nature of, a, of the job, as well as the stereotypes that I've explained to you of the profession, of that profession. He used those things to bring Moses to a place of humility in order that he could be used of God to deliver his people and fulfill his covenant promise to Abraham. Well, in here today in chapter 3, God is calling Moses to his destiny. And God's going to shock him out of his humdrum and life and nearly drag him kicking and screaming into the pages of history. And Moses is now hesitant to go back to Egypt. God has told him that I'll be with you. But Moses still has some excuse cards left to throw. How many of us have used these same excuses when it came to doing God's will in our lives? Let's look at uh, Exodus chapter 3, beginning with verse 16. God says here, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. 
And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Havites and the Jebusites to a land flowing with milk and honey. Then they will heed your voice, and you shall come, and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not even by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders which I will do in its midst, and after that he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be, when you go, that you shall not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. And so God here in this first few, these first few verses um, gives Moses the overall game plan. Now, this is, this is a venture in nation building, essentially from scratch. So they're poor shepherds. They're not, nobody's rolling in the money for the most part. He's got to take some overhead currency to start, a, to start a country, and he's working on that. But he tells Moses, first go and speak to the elders of Israel and let them know that God, and, and tell them that God's going to deliver them so they can return to the promised land. And then once they're on board with that, Moses is then to confront Pharaoh and tell him that they wanted to go into the desert for three days to worship. And God tells Moses, look, I know Pharaoh is not going to go along with this. He's, he's just not going to do it. It's a shame and honor culture. And if you, you've got to understand that to understand why things are done and said the way they are throughout the Bible. When you see someone asking a question, uh, in our culture, it's totally the opposite. If someone says something and, or I ask you a question in public, it's to get information. All right, that's the total flip, reverse, 180 out of how it works throughout the Bible. In the shame and honor culture, um, if you want information, you ask someone in private. That's why you see the disciples, when they ask Jesus something, they always bring him over to the side. When you ask someone a question in public in front of everybody, it's done to shame them. And that's the opposite. We don't do that. We'll, if we, in our culture, if you think it's going to shame them, you come over here, let me, let's talk. Let's go for coffee or something like that. Totally different. And this is a shame and honor culture that we're dealing with here. So, so Moses is coming out in front of the king, in front of Pharaoh, and then God knows that Pharaoh can't let this happen because he's got to save face. All right, and you still see this kind of in foreign policy and politics nowadays. But God tells him, he said, Pharaoh's not going to go for this. The king of the most powerful nation, at least in that section of the world, barring the Far East, um, he's not going to go for this. I'm telling you right now. And God told him, God told Moses, Pharaoh's going to go down swinging. And God knows this because God knows the end from the beginning. He's telling him, this is going to be a fight. So when God calls us to something, it's not always just going to be, hey, we're just going to roll right through here and everything's going to be groovy, it's going to be smurfy, it's going to be smooth, and there aren't going to be any problems. Because as soon as we run up against some kind of, of, of uh, uh, resistance, all of a sudden, oh no, is God in this? God was in it all the way. But what we have to see throughout this endeavor is that Every res facet of resistance that Moses faces is there for a reason. It teaches Moses and the Israelites one thing. It teaches the Egyptians uh, sometimes the same thing, sometimes something else altogether. But, and it's going to have ramifications that, that last and that you hear all the way 40 years later when Israel enters the promised land. All of this is still being talked about. So it's there for a purpose. It's not just about us. God, Jesus, has been, uh, been brought down now in, in today's culture to our cosmic life coach. Isn't that sweet? And it's all about me, isn't it? Jesus is all about me and making me happy and making my life easy. That ain't in the Bible. It's not in the gospel. Might be in some songs you hear on the radio, but it's not in the Bible. 
And it might be preached from time to time, but it's not in the Bible. There's a purpose to all this. God also lets Moses know how he was going to finance the trip and found and finance, uh, excuse me, and found this new nation. The Egyptians would pay them to leave. That's what we just read. They're going to pay you. Here, take all my money and get out of town, please. Your God has so disrupted our order of life, our civilization. He has so beaten down our gods, little g. Just get out of town, take my money, take my things, go. So they're going to plunder the, the riches of the Egyptians without having to take anything by force. Now that's a plan. This overarching plan. Then we roll into chapter 4, verse 1. Look what it says. It says, Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, see, supposing a lot, The Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And he, being Moses, said, It's a rod. Because he's a shepherd. And that's what you do. Is you have a stick that you walk around with. And he said, Cast it on the ground. So he, Moses cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it, which is what most people do when they see a snake. Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Now, this is where most people would first start throwing in another excuse. No, I don't go to that church. <laughs> I don't do that snake handling part. You know. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. So it turned back into his staff. Verse 5, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, now put your hand in your bosom, or inside his coat, you know, like a Napoleon type pose, Napoleonic type pose. And he put his hand in his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again, and he drew it out of his bosom, and behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Then God speaks again. Then it will be if they not believe you, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be, if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river and pour it on the dry land. Then the water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. Now, last week or two weeks ago, Moses asked a couple of questions. He said, speaking to the Lord in the burning bush, he said, Who am I? And he said, And while I'm at it, who are you? And this week, and we talked about some of those were legitimate, but it's also, Who am I? Wait a minute, this isn't for me. We see him continuing along this kind of the same theme as he as he um, offers up three more excuses. The first excuse is, "What if they don't believe me when I say that you've spoken to me?" Now, what did God ask him? God asked simply uh, Moses, "What is in your hand?" And Moses had his staff. That was your tool. That's your main tool as a shepherd. If you're a mechanic, you got it. You got boxes full of tools. If you're, you know, we got a bunch of techies, you've got your computers and jump drives and whatever other stuff you tote around working on computers. Everybody has, a doctor has his stethoscope, that's his main thing, so he can listen to you for five seconds and charge you a gazillion dollars. But this is the tool. I got to be careful, we got a doctor in here. Where's Jordan? He's hiding somewhere. Moses had a shepherd's staff, which is the tool that he's been carrying for 40 years. What Moses had in his hand was enough. That's all he needed. It was enough. He didn't need anything else. When Moses balked last week, God told him that he would be with him. And that should be enough. As I said then, for most of us, it's not. And now God is sending Moses with the tool he is most accustomed, a staff, Moses' ordinary staff and the power of God, the calling of God, uh, kind of the same thing right here, render the staff as being miraculous. God empowers us, is empowering us, makes us capable of accomplishing our mission. So many times in our own lives and actions, 
uh, and not it's it's our a lot it's our actions in our lives and not so much our words that speak for us. And that is why it's important that we walk the walk and not just talk the talk. So he gives him not only what he's saying, but Moses has a rep, if you will. He had a bad one when he left town, but Moses has to be all in on this. And he said, I'm giving you all that you need. All that you need. I'm sending with you on this mission. You are now deemed capable. Moses is still, no, 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 I'm not really. Look at verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I'll be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. So Moses comes back with, Look, okay, you got me a stick. You've told me I'm supposed to go. i got this stick, which I've had that for 40 years, and you make it turn into a snake, and I can do the hand trick and all that kind of stuff, but you're asking me to speak. I'm not eloquent. Well, I'm not either. And You might be questioning my ability. But the point is, Moses now throws that out there. I'm not eloquent, and God knows it's not true. He said, I've made your mouth. If I made the thing, I can make it work for you. Furthermore, 40 years ago, you didn't have any problem standing up and stating what you believed or or even going to uh, to fisticuffs in order to prove it. And now you're backing down. God knows this is bogus. We read in Acts chapter 7 that Moses was mighty in word and deed. We have elsewhere, now this comes later on, this this writing, but we know elsewhere that he was capable. We also know that he was educated in the best schools of Egypt. So this is just an excuse, and it's ramping up to something else, but God is patient with Moses just as he is with us when we offer up excuses. There might be a tendency here for none of us to put ourselves in the place of Moses, because after all, I mean, good grief. Jesus, is, Jesus quotes him. He is a, one of the biggest players in all the Bible. Certainly none of us have led a nation out of bondage. We haven't done anything like that. But at the same time, in our place, in our calling in God's plan, Moses just like us. We are just like him. And that same calling is that same enabling. And the same excuses we give, those are all the same. And the same God is willing to work with us Despite our excuses, he's still willing to work with us. And look what he does. He is working Moses through his own disbelief, through his own excuses. And that speaks volumes. Because some, we get, some of us get so nervous sometimes and we know God is saying to do something or what have you and we, we're kicking against the goads as the Apostle Paul did, whatever. And these things start coming up and these, these reasons, the excuses, and then... The Holy Spirit speaks something to us at back, and we're back and forth. We're almost negotiating. And, it, and we look at it, oh my, I'm fighting with God. I got to I be honest with you. You know, there have been, I've been in a few scraps in my day, and there are some of them I wasn't worried about. There's some of them when that guy stands up, you think, what in the world have I gotten myself into? Like those two towns that were on each side of the river from each other, and they were having a fight over which was the greatest town, and they were going to settle it by having a brawl from the biggest, baddest dude from each village at the middle of this bridge that crosses the river. So town A, they get their baddest, biggest, baddest dude, and you know he's the bare-knuckle fist-fighting champion of their county, what have you. And every, each city is on each side of the river, and he's walking out to the bridge, and he gets about halfway, and he looks up. He turns around and he comes back. And they said, what are you doing? you got to go fight this guy. He said, I'm not fighting Clarence. He said, who's Clarence? He said, well, he got his name up there on the bridge. It says Clarence, 16 foot 3 inches. I ain't going over there. <laughs> and I don't blame him. I knew a guy that in school, he would fight anybody. He's like that kid on the Bad News Bears. He was a scrapper and he was tough. Wasn't that big, but he'd fight a train if you told him to. And he hit... The, the guy that was 
he was the guy that people came from around, all around to fight this one guy, who's a friend of mine, I'm glad to say, and he's a football coach now. Um, and he got one lucky punch in on this big guy, knocked him down and sat on his chest, and he's, he hits him several times. And then the other guy stood up while Danny was still on his chest. And now he's grabbing his shirt, and you can see it in his eyes. Danny's eyes, oh, God help, what have I done? I've just made him mad, and I've given him every bullet in my gun. And we, can, we tend to think, if this is the point of all that nonsense, is that we look at ourselves, I'm fighting God, I'm fighting God, I'm boxing God, and, and, and God's mad at me and all this. Hang on. God is not mad yet at Moses. He's working him through it. God knows the end from the beginning. He already knows the excuses. He already knows that we don't want to get out of our comfort zones. He already knows all these things. And what does he do? He doesn't, you know what I would do? Just bam, get over it, man up, pull up, and get going. That's my way of dealing with it, which is not God's way. That's the easy way. But, well, it's easy on my part. It's not necessarily easy. It does, it's not necessarily effective. But it's the easiest way to do it, to go about it in the first place. But God doesn't do that. He anticipates all that. So what does he do? Every objection Moses gives, God counters it with a, not just a reason why you need to go do this. All right? This is what I'm giving you. That is no longer a viable excuse. Well, what about this? All right, I'm going to do this. I'm giving you an answer. I'm giving you what you need. I'm taking away the reason for your anxiety. So God responded here by asking him, who makes the mouth of a man? God made it, therefore Moses uh, um, should be capable of, of performing the assigned task. And once again, God is telling him, I will be with you in this. And once again, this is all we really need to know. But for most of us, it isn't in our mind. I'm not a good speaker. I'm not a people person. You don't have to be a good speaker to talk to people. It helps to hone your craft if you're up here. But just to talk to people, you don't have to, to, to be a good speaker. Moreover, the main thing is you just really have to be concerned. Passion for people and being passionate about God are all that is really required. Think about that. Passion for people and passion about God, passion, being passionate about God are all that's really, requ really required. When you care, it is amazing what you can do, and we should all care about the lost. God has told us to go and make disciples, and therefore He is with us in that endeavor, and that is all we need, and it's all we need to know. But we still kind of think, well, there's something else. They're going to ask me a question I can't answer. But we got resources for that. But that's still no reason to go. All you got to say is, I'll get back with you on that. We can, we can help you with that. Look at verse 13. Moses responds again. But he said, oh, Lord, please send by the hand. Now, this is after God has answered the objection. But, Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else. <laughs> you may send just somebody, anybody, not me. Whomever else you may send. And now, verse 14 is the point we don't want to reach. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, and look, no lightning bolt. The ground doesn't open up and swallow him here. But he's, he's getting a little agitated at this point. Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. <clears throat> and look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he'll be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God, and you shall take this rod in your hand with which you shall do the signs. And so now Moses has offered up the last card in his deck. He's out of excuses, and now the truth comes out. In reality, Moses is just plain unwilling to go. Moses is happy where he is. He has become accustomed um, to his life. He has established a comfort zone, and he doesn't want to get out of it. And I would venture to say that most of us 
have made for ourselves some sort of comfort zone. I don't know how many of you fish, but if you do, at certain times of the year, right around the banks, you'll see these little circles in the dirt. And the brim will go around, they'll swim in circles, and they'll kind of make a little cup, and that's where they lay their eggs, that's a bed. All right, that's what they make their bed, and that's their comfort zone, and they're good at taking their tails and swiping anything out of that comfort zone. And they stay for the most part in there, and they just keep anything out. And we as humans can do the same thing. We like our comfort zone. And if God wants to bring us out of it, I'm aware of this, buddy. Sometimes you can ask somebody, would you be willing to help with this? Eh, well, mm, that's really not me. That's, you know, uh, I, I, I'm, and you hear this, I'm not a good speaker. I'm not good with people. I'm not this. Look, I didn't ask you to build a building. You know, could you, would you mind doing this? You know, and, it, and you hear the same things. Because, let's face it, we get into our routines and we like them. And I'm no different. I've got my routine and I like it. And when I'm doing, uh, when I'm walking, I've got my audio book or podcast going and I'm, Trying to get my exercise, I'm, in my mind, I'm killing two birds with one stone. I'm studying, I'm working in, or there's three maybe, and getting some exercise at the same time, and then, ring! Hello, dear. You get some milk on the way home? Yeah, because I had planned to stop on the way home. Because I've already got my day planned, see. And now someone else has thrown a wrench in it, and that aggravates me. What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to say, yes, honey, I would love to stop by and get some milk on the way home. And that's exactly how I answer every time, right? No. <clears throat> Something has now got into my comfort zone. I don't like it. Someone's added to my list of things to do during the day. Mm. Moses has established his comfort zone and doesn't want to get out of it. And we also see God's response change right here at this point. Now he is mad because Moses' excuses have finally manifested in rebellion. Not like down with you, God, that sort of thing. But now he's worked through the excuses and Moses finally just is saying, I don't want to go. Find somebody else. And that now, when he just roosters up and says, I'm not going. Now God is angry because now it's not just an excuse. Now it's rebellion. And you see what God has done? He has worked him through this. Now Moses knows the state of his own heart. He could justify it before with all these little straw men he's throwing out there. But now we've gotten down to the brass tacks. And now God says, now, you see? Now this is something God doesn't tolerate well, which is rebellion. He's still gracious. And he's still long-suffering. He didn't smite him with a, with a lightning rod or a plague or anything else. I once worked for a very large aircraft manufacturer. <clears throat> I'll try to keep politics out of this. But there were many people there, I would venture to say most of the people there, that um, didn't have very much of a work ethic. And they had a list of excuses as long as their arm as to why they couldn't get their work done on time. And in my frustration, I asked a supervisor one time, how can you deal with this stuff day in and day out? Because I was used, I've been in management, I was used to telling them this is what we got to do. And it's one thing if you don't know, we can help you, train you. But it's one thing, I just ain't going to do it. Well, my favorite saying was, well, you know what? There's a door. Don't let it hit you where the good Lord split you. That was what I'd say. That's my way of dealing. But we had me working for a large company that you couldn't say that for various organized labor reasons. And I asked, I asked him, I said, how do you put up with this? How do you, we're constantly behind, they're just lazy, you, how do you put up with this? And his answer was, you just keep taking away the excuses. And once they're done, once you've taken away all the excuses, you're left with what you have to deal with. You've peeled that onion back, you've peeled the clove of garlic back down to the base now. And the answer is, you just don't want to work in that scenario. And now God has peeled that back. And in, and in going through this, Moses is able to see it. He's worked through his own self-justification of these things. And now he's able to see. I'm without excuse. You're right. I just don't want to go. 
Now God can deal with a man's heart. The, the, what's at the root of it. And that rebellion is still at the root of all our hearts. We just don't want to go. So once again, God knows the end from the beginning. God knew Moses didn't really want to go, but he had to take Moses through all of these excuses so that he could see his own rebellion. If God had said, oh, all right, I'll find someone else better suited for the job, then look what situation this leaves Moses in. Then Moses would have forever been unfulfilled and in rebellion. And God doesn't want to lose it, leave him in that state. His life would have been a mess. And I believe this sort of thing is the source of many people's depression because they live in their excuses and if they're not challenged, they, they meander, about in life, uh, uh, meander about in a life of unfulfilled mediocrity. They just can't get out. They just can't. It's this mm, mully grubs, we call them growing up. Just can't ever get going. Their life, my life stinks. I just can't. And it's, it's not because God doesn't have something for them. It's because they just don't want to... They're locked in a comfort zone that they like, but yet they're still unfulfilled. This is why you see people, they get all that they want. They sell a gazillion records. They make a million movies. And you know what? You read about them later. Gone through divorce. They're hooked on pills and everything else. And their life is a misery because they're still unfulfilled. They've gotten everything they think they want they need and it still doesn't fit it still doesn't work they live in their excuses and if they're not challenged and people don't want to challenge because we don't want to hurt their feelings some people need a shock treatment sometimes sometimes you've got to everybody should have a football helmet and then you're so you're able to grab it twist it pick it up pull it and get there you know what i'm talking about get there to every we need that shock treatment sometimes because you're, you'll never be as miserable as you are when you put off God's will for your own life and are allowed to wallow, waller, wallow in that state. Waller, that means you've seen a hog. They get down there and they just roll in it. That's what people, pity party, let's roll in it. They're unfulfilled. And they've been kicking against the, the pricks. God supplied Moses with his brother Aaron here. But as we're going to see, Aaron is not always an asset as you go through the story of Israel. And that's one of the things that God does. One of the ways God chastens us is to give us what we want. And you realize, oh, this wasn't so great. You ever done that? Had to have that car. Had to have that house. Now I don't want to have to pay for it. I had to have that woman. Now, or that man. And now I'm wishing, think about Roy Clark's song, Thank God and Greyhound, She's Gone, that sort of thing. You know, I know none of you feel that way, and you shouldn't. But, I mean, you had to have it, and then all of a sudden it becomes a burden. Aaron becomes a liability later on. God has a plan for this world and for your life. He really does. It breaks down to each one of us individually. And He wants to include you in His plan. That's part of the overarching story of the Bible, is that God, you see Him... You see him um, working with the, what's called the divine council in the book of Job and other places in the Old Testament. He's talking with these heavenly beings. He doesn't have to to do anything. He can just speak anything and it, it happens, but he works through them. And he's got another family here on earth that he wants to work through. He wants to include us. He doesn't need us. He doesn't. But he wants us to be involved in his plan. And in, and in doing whatever it is or being called to anything, we can truly feel inadequate that is to be expected. The truth is that we are all inadequate without God. But God uses inadequate people. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. So we're all inadequate. We're all inadequate. I don't care how much schooling you've done, you've gotten in your field, you might be the top of it at the top of your field. You might be the world's number one ro uh, rocket scientist or brain surgeon or whatever. But we all know, no matter how much schooling and training you've gotten, no matter how well you did in your training, when you're put out there and now this is your first surgery, something goes through your head. This is actually me now. I've got to do this. Oh, you've been through 40, 11 years of school. Yeah, but now it's really where the rubber meets the road. We've all been there. We've all, the greatest in the world at anything, whatever that is, has felt inadequate, I assure you, at some time. 
And that is the point. That God is the one that is to be glorified. Not Moses. It is His name that is to be lifted up. Moses had all that he needed in his hand as long as God was with him. He didn't go marching in with his army. He came in with a little stick. Yeah, walk up to the White House with a stick. No matter which side of the political aisle you're on, and think you're going to change things. That is ludicrous, but that's what, he, that's what Moses does because God had empowered him. All that he needed was what he had in his hand as long as God was with him. All Moses needed was to be willing. All he has to be is available. That's all any of us need is to be available. Richard Ellsworth Day said this. He said, It would be no surprise if a study of secret causes were undertaken to find that every golden era in human history proceeds from the devotion and passion of one single individual. There are no bona fide mass movements. It just looks that way. At the center column, there's always one man who knows God and knows where he's going. And the first thing I think of right there is Dr. King marching across the bridge down to Selma. One, he's the key to that. Right here, it's Moses. He's, he's the man in this case. We all have the potential to reach people around us if we're willing. If we're available, God wants to use us and include us in His plans. And yes, sometimes He hounds us in order to get us because He so wants us involved in His plans. He wants to reward us for these things in heaven. And what we have is enough when it's given to God and our wills are submitted to Him. Now those of you that have been around Calvary Chapel forever, this will, will, will resonate with you. What I'm, 50 years ago, a man and his wife, a pastor and his wife are sitting out on one of the beaches there in California and they're looking at all these hippies that have come from all over the country. And they're nasty and they're unkempt and they're barefooted and they're high and they're, they're drunk and they're, they're just everything that's bad, you know. And every, some people get this story wrong. The couple was Chuck, was Chuck and Kay Smith. And people think that Chuck said, oh, we really need to reach these people. Chuck was like, no, they need to get a bath and get a job is what they need to do. And that's my, that's my, the way I look at it. And Kay said, no, Chuck. They need to be ministered to. Nobody's going to let them in their churches. And I'm sure Chuck said, they don't even want to go to church. And Kay said, we've got to reach out to these people. And so Chuck took the counsel of his wife, they set up a tent on the beach, and he just starts teaching verse by verse, no gimmicks, no fog and light mirror shows or anything like that. And the Jesus movement was birthed. And out of that came Calvary Chapel as a movement. And so I said that to tell you what, what the, to support the quote I just gave from Richard Day. All it took was one, in this case one woman, to get her husband on board to change an entire generation. All it took was that one man, Moses. All it took was Dr. King, and I know there are others that work with him, but he was a central part of it. There's no bona fide mass movement. It's an individual. How many of us can be that individual in our own little microcosm of a way, in our own little microcosm of a world? When God says, you can do this, I need you to do this. Yeah, but, you know, I got stuff to want on the DVR I need to watch. No, get up. Moses just had to be willing. And God wasn't angry until Moses was just plain unwilling to go. Once God had gotten through all the layers down to the heart of the matter, God did get a little angrier. God used what Moses had in his hand. What he didn't have, God supplied him. And when God got angry, Moses had reached the point of rebellion. Just know he dug in his heels. I'm not going to do that. If you've got children, you've seen that. I'm not going to eat that. That didn't work in my house. I think they call it waterboarding now. <laughs> oh, you're going to eat it. And I did. And later I learned to like it. But Moses is being pushed by God, and he, Moses, is showing reluctance. And we've all been there at some point in time. These things, this reluctance, this hesitancy, this rebellion, 
unfortunately, are, give, are givens in our lives. But what we should see above and beyond that, don't ever look at it and focus just on you. What we should see beyond that is how God's grace moves us along, reasoning with us, the Holy Spirit reasoning with us in order to move us into His will. We see God, as He starts out, He's being patient, at least until the point of rebellion, at which time God does get a little stern. But He doesn't nuke Him right there. And, what we, and we focus right on this one little thing. He said, man, God doesn't have much patience. He's talking to Moses for 15 or 20 minutes, and He's already mad. Ha, ha, no, 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 no. He's been dealing with Moses for 40 years. Actually, really 80 years at this point. Throughout his childhood and now the 40 years in the desert. 80 years to get him to this point. I told you, God doesn't, always get, doesn't usually get in a hurry. In the bigger picture, we're looking at 40 years of God's moving before he has to really become stern. God is gracious. He is long-suffering or patient as he deals with us. And he wanted what was best for Moses as he... God prepared him for his part in God's plan, and he wants the same for us. Thank you, God, for your grace. Would you all bow your heads, please? You know, uh, it's not always easy waiting on God to provide something. I'll let you all in on a little secret. I don't know if I've said it before or not. You know, I get pulpit immunity, which means you get to forget your stories and tell them endless numbers of times. But um, the youth group has grown from like five or six to as many as 28. Yeah, okay, hang on. I'm not through. Y'all not going to clap here in a minute. I'm having to run that show. Yeah, exactly. By myself, for the most part, yeah. I'm not asking for pity. I'm asking for help. Because there are no signs this is going to stop growing, and you're correct. 80%, 90% 80%, 90% of those kids don't come to this church, and that's fine. We're getting them. Maybe they will at some point. The end goal is not to just increase the number of tails in seats. That's a good thing, but that's not the end goal. The, the object is to minister to them. And so maybe that's, you feel that's out of your comfort zone. Maybe not. I don't know. And if I have 10 people come up to me after church, and, and, and you hate children, you're probably not going to be one that I talk to. But, you know, I'm just putting that out there. This is, it's hard to wait. It's been months in the making here. But God is moving, and I can't go without, so I'm going within in the church. See who's serious about this. this is, we always need help. One of the things I've said is that, uh, I know I'm bleeding into Jacob's time here, um, if you look at the percentage of people in this church that are plugged in and doing something other than just showing up on Sunday, it's the highest percentage of any church I know of. It's right at 80% of you are plugged in to multiple ministry or, or doing children's ministry, worship ministry, clean team, hospitality, all these different things. That's awesome. Every pastor I know covets that when I talk to them. Here's the crazy thing. We still got holes to fill. So... God is calling all of us in something. I'm not saying it's to youth. I'm not saying it's to clinking, whatever. But at some point, for the kingdom's sake, we need to break out of our comfort zone. And that will mean reprioritizing. But at the same time, if you're fighting that, it could be God working you through the excuses in order to whittle you down to the very last thing. Would you all bow your heads? Father, we thank you. I love you for your grace, Lord. We thank you so much for your long-suffering. And Lord, you are dealing with all of us at different times in different ways with different things and issues, Father. And, and to each one of us, they each seem like Mount Everest. They each seem like a major thing in our life. And that's fine. But Lord, you're dealing with us. And you're working with us slowly so that we become convinced. We don't want knee-jerk reactions. We don't want guilt trips or anything else, Father. We just ask, I ask, that you continue your grace and your long-suffering as you work us through these things, as you peel back the excuses, the reasons, the fears, the anxieties we have to get down to the point where you show us, Father, how you 
have empowered us and how you are all we need and how we, you've given us what we need, Father, in order to do what you would have us do. So I, I pray that we would see the peace that comes from that and we'd see the anxiety and the other things fall away. And I thank you for it, Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.